Our next speaker will be Marcus Noble, who works as a platform engineer at Giant Swarm. And his work is basically focusing on, guess what, Kubernetes and containers and DevOps. And in his talk right now, he'll be uh, talking about how to run Kubernetes clusters uh, without going mad or insane. The talk will cover some practical tips and uh, for any experience level with Kubernetes. Cool. Thank you very much. Let me just get my slides up one second. Cool. Should we just give it a few minutes before we kick off, or should we start now? Uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, there are still, still people still coming, so... I'll give it. I'll give it another minute. So it's five past, and then we. And I'll, I'll stop. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off. Um, so as I said, I'm gonna be talking about some practical tips that I've learned on how to manage Kubernetes clusters um, without losing your cool. Um, so before I get into that, just a little bit about me to give you a bit of context. I'm a platform engineer at Giant Swarm. Um, if you want to find me around the web, I'm usually average Marcus or uh, Marcus at Ks social on Macedon. But I've got about five, probably six years experience now running Kubernetes in production. Um, and throughout that time, I have gone through kind of the different roles that interact with Kubernetes. So I started out as a, an app developer working on full stack Node.js applications, deploying my applications to Kubernetes. I migrated into uh, a kind of a, a support team that built out tooling to help other teams work with their Kubernetes clusters. I then moved on to more building applications, uh, building system applications to be deployed onto Kubernetes, so controllers, operators, that kind of thing. And then finally kind of moved into full-blown operational management of Kubernetes clusters. So I've kind of experienced a few different ways that people work with Kubernetes. And throughout that time, I've picked up a few things that I'd, I'd like to share with everybody today. Um, so, so I say, these are going to be kind of my, my top tips for working with Kubernetes. Um, and I've broken them down into the first five uh, anybody can, can pick up uh, today. Anybody that's working with Kubernetes, you can start using these today if you're not already. Um, six and seven would be good to have a little bit more kind of like old school ops knowledge. So comfortable with the terminal using some uh, Linux uh, commands, etc. Uh, and then because of how much time we've got today, I'm going to just summarize at the end some additional things that's uh, worth looking into for more advanced uh, uh, ways of working with Kubernetes that can save you time, save you headaches when things go wrong. So without further ado, let's kick off with my first tip, and that's love your terminal. So uh, for anybody that's worked with Kubernetes for any kind of length of time, you'll know that at some point you'll be using Kube Control to access your cluster and figure out what's going on. So regardless of what you use, whether you use Bash, ZSH, Fish, Power, Dell on Windows, whatever it may be, I recommend spending a bit of time to get comfortable with what you're using and kind of work out how to best use it for, for yourself. So whether that's learning the different aliases that are available, learning the different tool that's available, um, setting the right font in your in your terminal to, so you can, you're can you more comfortable when working with it, whatever that may be. Um, I also highly recommend leveraging uh, the RC files for like Bash RC, ZSH RC, things like that, where you can build in your own aliases, which are um, short commands that allow you to do more complex commands uh, behind, behind the scenes. Um, 
I use these a lot for commands that I type a lot, but but because of how clumsy I am when it comes to typing, I do a lot of typos and things like that. So I want them as short as possible. Um, I also recommend looking out for dot files on GitHub and things like that. This is where people have shared their terminal shortcuts and things that you can get uh, and kind of copy and tweak for your own usage. And mine are available there if you are at all interested. So a quick follow up from that is also learn to love Kube Control itself. Um, so first thing I recommend uh, going back to tip number one is add an alias for Kube Control to shorten it to K just to speed up when you're typing out all these different commands. Um, you can add additional ones if you want. If you need commands to get all pods, you can you can have an alias for that or, or whatever it may be. Um, but I recommend kind of whatever you use repeatedly and you don't want to have to keep making mistakes when you're kind of clumsy typing at 2 a.m. responding to an alert, um, make a little alias or a, or a helper script to help you with that. Uh, I also highly recommend the official documentation on the Kubernetes IO website for the different commands. There's, there's a really good single page uh, website that, that gives you Detailed information of all the commands and all the flags and all the options that you can have uh, for, for each of them. It's a great way to kind of go in, control F, and then find what you're you wanting to work with. Um, but there's also Kube Control Explain. So there is a command in Kube Control that allows you to access uh, the uh, open API schema of uh, resources in your cluster. So if you want to know what properties a particular resource uh, can support, can have what value, you can use Kube Control Explain to have a look at this right from your terminal. So you can see an example on the, on the right here where we did Kube Control Explain our, our pods.spec.containers, and we're then getting all the documentation for the containers property in the pod spec. So we can then dig into that and, and fill out the, the values as we need without having to go off to some External resource. And this also works with uh, custom resource definitions as well, providing they have an open API along with their resource in the cluster. Tip number three, uh, working with multiple kube configs. Um, so at some point, it's more than likely that you're going to have more than one Kubernetes cluster that you work with. If you're an app developer, this may be multiple environments. So it may be dev, production, staging, a local kind cluster, whatever that may be. Um, and if you're more of a platform engineering team, it may be tens to hundreds of different clusters that you're working with. Switching between the different clusters, uh, it's fairly easy with Kube Control, but uh, it's prone to mistake. You kind of uh, not always clear what cluster you're pointing at. Um, so I highly recommend looking at one of these three projects. Um, I personally use Kube Switch at the bottom that allows me to uh, structure all my different cube configs in a in a, a hierarchical directory structure, and it will just search over all of them for me when I'm switching. It's, it's very nice. But all three of them do pretty much the same sort of thing. Allows you to nicely switch clusters and between namespaces uh, quite easily. So then all your subsequent commands go to that. If terminals are not really your thing, you're not you're not uh, keen on typing out loads of commands and all this kind of thing. Next thing to look at is interact lies. There are two that, that I'll kind of recommend. If you are still comfortable enough in the terminal, uh, I highly, highly recommend the K9S tool. Um, you can see it here. It's a terminal-based interactive display of your cluster, and it allows you to do so much. View the current state of things, so pods, nodes, deployments, ingress, whatever it may be, and allows you to go in there and edit things. It things allows you to uh, patch uh, resources and things like that and I spend probably percent of my time using this sort of tool to, to interact with the various clusters that I've got and I highly recommend it but if terminal is not really your thing and you want something a bit more visual a bit more uh, mouse driven I can also recommend open lens so it's the same basic principle but it's with a, it's a desktop application where you can click with your mouse you can see live updates of, of uh, of graphs, um, of logs, things like that. These tools also allow you to uh, view the logs as they're happening from your pods, which is very nice. And it also gives you a way of actually executing into your uh, containers that are running in your cluster to do some debugging. We'll come to this a little bit in a moment. 
Next thing I want to talk about is cube control plugins. So these are fantastic. Cube control is really clever the way that it handles plugins. So basically anything on your path within your within your terminal session that is prefixed with cube control hyphen something becomes a cube control plugin implicitly. That something after the hyphen becomes the name of the plugin. So for example, on the right here, we have a file called control hello. And all it does is echo out hello cube. And we can then call that just by typing out cube control hello. And that becomes a, a, a plugin that we can then use. Now, writing out little, these bash scripts, yes, we can build our own little toolings, but uh, the, the real power that you've got behind it is there's a whole community around building different plugins for Cube Control that allow you to do lots of different things. There is a Cube Control plugin called Crew that is a plugin to manage plugins for Cube Control, which is very kind of meta and um, but allows you the, the, uh, there's a website they've got that kind of lists all of the, the different ones that they've got, and you can very easily install them with then Cube Control Crew install and then the plugin name. Um, and just very quickly, some of the the, the ones that I, I uh, use quite a lot and, and are my favorites. Um, Stern is a fantastic plugin that allows you to tail the logs of multiple containers, multiple pods at the same time using like filtering and, and all this kind of thing. So if you have an application that's over three different controllers, for example, and four different replicas or whatever, Stern allows you to view all of those streams together and allows you to look out for errors and all this kind of things. Very nice. Um, Tree is very cool if you uh, work with things like Cluster API that has this long hierarchical tree of resources being owned by other resources. It allows you to point, say, at your cluster resource in, in, in Cluster API, and you see all the descendants. So you see the machines, you see the control plane. Uh, um, one that's uh, very typical at the moment is the community images one. What this will do will take a look in your cluster and will let you know if you are referencing any container image still using the old kh.gcr.io uh, registry. If you're not already aware, that's going to be deprecated and is going to be pointing to a new registry. Um, so I highly recommend running this against the clusters that you uh, manage. See if there's any that, that you, you've missed um, and get those updated to the using the new registry. And then finally, just a little shout out to a GS plugin that we have at Giant Swarm. So this is what we provide for our customers to make it easier for them to work with the clusters that, that we provide and manage for them. So we've built this tooling that just plugs straight into their Kube Control um, like everything else and allows them to kind of have some helper functions around getting the, the various workload clusters and things like that. So section one is kind of done nice and cool. Um, as I said, the next two that we're going to go on to Ideally, could do with a little bit old school, um, but I think I think everybody's going to be kind of comfortable with them enough if uh, the water five wasn't a problem. So, pod debugging. Um, anybody that's used Kubernetes for a reasonable amount of time will have had to debug a broken pod or a broken deployment at some point. It kind of it, it, it's inevitable it, the way I see it, and there's very go about doing this. And I have some uh, helper tools that I like to use for this uh, process. So going back to tip number one, again, with our terminal, um, we're using these aliases and things like that. I have this alias called case shell um, that is just a wrapper around a kube control run command that allows me to just create a, a new temporary pod within my cluster that just has bash, or you can change it out for Alpine or Ubuntu or whatever tooling you need general cluster-wide debugging. So I use this a lot when I'm seeing issues with networking and with um, uh, like uh, cross-pod communication issues, things like that. If, if Summit looks a bit off in the cluster as a whole, this is my, my go-to tool to, to try and start figuring out what's going on. So for example, I will launch this, this case shell and then I want to do a NS lookup uh, against google.com to see if uh, DNS resolution is working. So if core DNS is actually working or not within my cluster, for example. And as you can see here, this is returning back a, a valid response and it, I can then move on to uh, whatever the next thing might be that could be causing the issue. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is Q-Control exec. Um, so this allows you to uh, drop into a shell within a running container in your cluster to kind of figure out 
what is going wrong within that container uh, that might be causing an error. Um, there are some, uh, the container that you are trying to execute into uh, needs a valid shell environment for you to, to drop into. It needs, a, it needs a, uh, an interactive terminal. Um, so, for example, if you are building uh, containers based on Go binaries that, that just have the single binary, so like from scratch, uh, that won't this 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 approach won't work for those containers. Um, you're also only limited uh, so you're limited to what's available within the container itself, or what you're able to then pull into the container. So, all of the tooling, like debugging tools that you may want are likely not going to be in that container because you don't necessarily want to be deploying those to production, for example. So you may have to rely on installing them into a running cluster to, sorry, into a running container to start debugging these problems. Um, and then the final one, which is quite a big one, is the container needs to be running. So if you've got a crash loop back off, this isn't going to work. So what I mean, so if I'm trying, into uh, a container that is just a go binary, we will see uh, that first error. So uh, basically, we, we don't have a shell environment to drop into, so this won't work for us. Um, similarly, there is also kube control debug, uh, which is available from Kubernetes 123. Um, and this is one of my go-to debugging tools uh, that I use all the time. Um, this has three different functions to it, but one of the main ones that I use is it allows you to create a new ephemeral container in a, an existing pod uh, with whatever container image you, what you want. Um, so I can create a new container within my, my pod that's having issues um, and with a bunch of debugging tooling built into that container and I can start trying to figure out what's going wrong. This is useful if we suspect it may be something like a network policy is blocking access or something that um, to do with like yeah. IP networking or, or something like that. We want to kind of figure out why this particular pod can't communicate with another pod, for example. Um, so a little example of uh, if we've got a pod that's crash loop, crash looping, uh, crash loop back off, um, the Kube control exec won't work. So we will basically drop into the shell when it's running. But as soon as that container exits, we will get kicked out. So we will only have like a matter of seconds potentially to actually do some debugging. So not ideal. But with Kube control debug, it allows us to bring up another container alongside our broken container to then try and figure out what's going on. Um, and a quick overview of kind of when to use each of the different um, scenarios. <clears throat> Node debugging. So if all your pods are looking good, we want to then maybe move on to the nodes themselves and maybe something there is going wrong. So we're going back to kube control debug again. One of the other um, capability that this has is node debugging. And this allows you to say kube control debug node slash and then the name of that node. And you can then give it a container image. And what this does is it launches a debugging pod on that node specifically and switches out the node's uh, process space and mounts the node's host uh, file system in the slash host. So you can get then full access to the node to an extent. Um, where you can then start debugging whether there's something wrong on the actual node itself um, that's causing problems with your Kubernetes cluster. Um, one of the questions I get with this is why not just SSH onto the node? Um, I personally prefer to have ephemeral instances where you don't have the ability to make changes to your, your running cluster, so no SSH, no port 22 open, things like that. Um, but if you've got SSH access, that may be a better way of, of doing this. One of the other things that this, this does provide, though, is you then have your access control to be able to do this managed by RBAC. So you, you can have RBAC rules to say who can and can't perform this action. If you are before Kubernetes 123, there is a, another workaround way of doing this. You can launch a privileged container with the nsenter um, command. This is of command that is even available as a tweet and as a sticker from, from Dr. Me in there. 
Um, this does have some caveats, though, is that the the node you are trying to debug needs to have a valid shell. So if you're using Talos Linux, for example, for your Kubernetes cluster, this will not work, whereas Kubectl debug will work. Um, and I have an example of this on my GitHub, and Giant Swarm also has a similar Kubectl plugin for this um, option. So those are my tips that I'm going to cover today. Um, been going over this pretty quickly, uh, but I want to very uh, briefly talk about if you've kind of covered all of those, what to look at next and where you can then get some real power out of making your clusters work for you. So webhooks. Uh, for those that kind of know me, they know that I have a, it's kind of a love-hate relationship when it comes to webhooks in Kubernetes. Um, they're a, a very core functionality with Kubernetes, they provide a lot of power, a lot of capabilities, but if not used correctly, they can break your cluster. And I have a, another talk where I talk about various scenarios where bad webhooks have taken down entire clusters. Um, so yeah, use with caution. But these allow you to do things like implementing some more advanced RBAC capabilities is all additive. Webhooks will allow us to take away some permissions. So there's some good example where we had an issue with Giant Swarm where we needed to take away a very particular issue, a very particular permission, because we found a bug in our in one of our CLI tools. And it would take too long to get the CLI uh, update out to all of our customers. So we needed to block it in the meantime. And uh, we were using, using Webhook, using a, a, a validating Webhook. And they allow you to do things like defaulting logic, enforce policies, like no, you, know, you can't use the latest tag on your container images and things like that. And one of the, the, the favorite examples, one of the examples is they have to hot fix some security issues. So I'm sure you remember the logbook shell incident that was a few years back now. Um, there's actually a, a Caverno policy that um, mitigates that vulnerability by setting a, a, a specific environment variable on all co on all containers um, running within your cluster. So effectively shuts off that vulnerability cluster wide. Um, and if you're, I recommend looking at either Caverno or OPA Gatekeeper or similar tools that uh, give you a more abstracted view on working with webhooks and allow you to do it in a more kind of declarative way. So with Caverno, for example, you create like a policy resource within your cluster and then that is picked up by Caverno and, and implemented for you. Similarly, uh, the Kubernetes API itself uh, is very powerful. Like all of these tools, obviously you're using the API in some regards, and there's a lot of tooling libraries and uh, uh, just help out there to be able to leverage this in your own in your own things. So if you are um, comfortable with Go, for example, there's the client Go, which um, you know, 80 to 90% of all operators are using, it seems. Um, but there is also a repository, uh, sorry, an organization on GitHub called Kubernetes Client, and under there it has a lot of officials, officially supported clients for the Kubernetes API in all sorts of different languages. So Node.js, Python, etc., whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and then you can use these to actually build out your own tooling. So we could take those uh, little bash scripts that we were building in our in our step one, and turn them into a more robust application. That Used for our for our uh, repetitive uh, tooling debugging whatever it is, um, and then you also may want to look at building out your own operators and extending Kubernetes itself so that it does the work for you rather than you having to manage things. And with that note, I want to talk about CRDs and operators. So CRDs are custom. So Kubernetes um, is fantastic in the way that it allows you to ex to extend. Kubernetes itself extend what it offers and extends the the logic that's built into it. So you can define your own resources that run within Kubernetes, and then you can build your own operators that that do work against those um, those resources. This allows you to basically put your cluster on autopilot, and you can build in logic that they use this reconciliation loop to make sure that based on some state of a particular resources, resource, other things happen that, that you want to happen. Um, so this, this diagram here is taken from a brilliant uh, article uh, by Container Solutions. I highly recommend reading it if you're interested in CRDs and operators. But the basic idea is a user submits a custom resource 
or updates custom resources in the cluster. There is an operator running within that cluster that watches for changes to those resources, watches for creations, deletions, updates, whatever it may be. And it takes those changes, performs some business logic, and then updates something else. So a good example of this is the cluster API project. So you have a cluster resource that you, you apply in your in your cluster. Cluster API watches that. When it sees new ones, it goes off and it creates a cluster else provider or wherever it is that you've got it configured to do. So let's recap. Um, Love your terminal. So if you're going to be using Kubernetes day in, day out, I highly recommend being comfortable with your terminal, with your CLI, with the um, the, the kube control commands and these these sort of things. So love kube control. Make sure you're comfortable with the various uh, things it offers. So things like control explain, uh, kube control debug commands, all these sort of things that are available to you. I highly recommend taking a look at that one page um, documentation and all the different commands that are available to you. Uh, if you work in multiple clusters, uh, make it easy for yourself and use all those toolings to switch kube configs easily. And have a look at these, these UI tools. So K9S and Open Lens, take a look at them, see development and your debugging, things like that. If you want to uh, extend kube control, uh, have a look at some kube control plugins. Um, uh, Stern and Tree and things like that. Uh, I highly recommend taking a look at those, but there is a big list of community provided ones on the crew website that um, I recommend taking a look through and just picking out the ones that, that look like they will solve your problems for you. And then pod debugging and node debugging. So leverage these tools that we've got. Leverage the aliases that we've got terminal, leverage the Kubernetes debug command, um, leverage scripts and things like that to make it as easy as possible for us to fix an issue at 2 a.m. when uh, we've had an alert that our cluster's broken. And then if you want to take it further, have a look into uh, Kubernetes webhooks and mutating and validating webhooks. Can we use the API to, to make our tool more robust and more powerful? And uh, CRDs and controllers for uh, actually making our cluster do the work for us so we don't have to. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>